Hello and welcome to Big Picture. I am Vishal Dahiya and today we will talk about the mounting global pressure on Pakistan on the issue of terror. After the dastardly terror attack in Pulwama carried out by Pakistan-based Jaish e Mohammed last week, India has started a diplomatic campaign against Pakistan to isolate it on the global stage and the efforts are bearing positive results. While close to 50 nations have issued strong statements condemning the ghastly terror attack, some, including Israel, have offered all kind of help to India in dealing with the menace of terror. France has said it will move a proposal at the United Nations to list Jaish chief Masood Azhar as global terrorist and take steps to retain Pakistan in the FATF grey list as well. Significantly, India's attempt to put Masood Azhar on the UNSC global terrorist list have been repeatedly blocked by China, with the latest being in 2017. United States of America has also asked Pakistan to immediately end the support and safe haven provided to all terror groups operating from its soil. For more on this, we're joined by a distinguished panel of guests today. Let me start by introducing them to you, beginning with uh, Mr. Prabhu Dayal, who is with us here. We also have uh, Dr. Shriram Cholia, uh, Professor and Dean of Jindal School of International Studies, and uh, Smita Sharma, the Deputy Editor of uh, the Tribune, somebody who has uh, kept a close watch on the developments uh, on the diplomatic aspect of it. Uh, Smita, let's begin with you only, and sort of a you know a recap as to what exactly have we done so far in terms of our diplomatic efforts and what kind of uh, fruits it have uh, borne in terms of the statements which have come from uh, various countries as well as the kind of support which they are giving to us? Well, what is very clear is that as the nation went into mourning and also expected a lot of resilience to be shown at the killing of 40 CRPF Jawans and one of the attacks that's been considered the most ghastly attacks in the last three decades in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, but the political class, mercifully, by and large, in the first 48 hours was largely restrained. We also saw the opposition come together, invest their faith in the political leadership and say that we are going to be with you. We are united at, in whatever decision you take. We do not want to politicize this attack, which was a good thing. In terms of the diplomatic offensive, we saw Foreign Secretary Vijay Gokhale hold several rounds of conversations with the envoys based in India. Mm -hmm. So over 48 hours, he first actually held individual briefings uh, with the envoys of the P5 countries, including that of China. Uh, and he also held uh, dialogues with uh, the ambassadors and high commissioners from the Gulf nations, the West Asian countries, many of them who actually continue to provide that important economic aid to Pakistan on which Pakistan continues to survive mm -hmm. and does not crack down on terror groups on its soil. Additionally, yesterday we had those comments coming through the French diplomatic sources, a confirmation that France is leading that motion backed by US and UK. It's been co-sponsored under the Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee of the Security Council, Resolution 1267, to mm -hmm. try and designate Masood Azhar as an internationally designated terrorist. Exactly the same way as it happened in 2017. It's happened. It's not the first time. There have been three attempts that have been made to proscribe Masood Azhar. And the villain we know is China, who has been using its veto power. What China has been arguing because they've been putting it on a technical hold, saying that while the evidence might link to Jashe Muhammad, the organization which is already banned and proscribed, the link does not sort of relate to Masood Azhar. Mm -hmm. We are not expecting China to play ball even this time. And in fact, the sources that I have been speaking to are saying that, look, while China's position increasingly becomes untenable and difficult to maintain, given that all the other P4 countries actually believe that this is the person who is responsible for this dastardly attack. But that does not even eventually change the equation because you have a veto that blocks the resolution. Okay. You also had the diplomatic advisor to Emmanuel Macron speak to Ajit Doval. In fact, yesterday uh, we saw John Bolton, the American national security advisor, have dialogue with Ajit Doval again. Mm -hmm. He tagged a wrong Ajit Doval on Twitter. It's a different thing. Mr. Dal, as uh, Smita has listed in terms of, you know, all kind of steps which have been taken by the government, all kind of, uh, you know, arguments which uh, India has put forth diplomatically. How far have we reached, uh, you know, in mounting that pressure on Pakistan and isolating it on a global stage vis-a-vis -vis terror? Well, first of all, let me mention that this idea of isolating Pakistan is almost impossible to achieve. You can put pressure on Pakistan. Isolating a country is virtually impossible because of the fact that it has its own connections, its own relationships. The Saudi Crown Prince which, as you mentioned, is currently in India. And as Smita said, she, he had just given $20 billion to Pakistan. 
and the announcement of this huge donation, mm -hmm. his, this huge assistance program to Pakistan came after the Pulwana attack. Now, it was also mentioned that China has been blocking any attempt to list Masood Azhar. China is Pakistan's all-weather friend. China has invested heavily in Pakistan. So again, to wean China away from Pakistan is going to be difficult. Pakistan also has very strong relationships with countries like Turkey mm -hmm. and some of the other countries of the Islamic world. So isolating may be very difficult. But, but mounting pressure. But mounting pressure is something that is achievable and that is being done. Smitha mentioned that the envoys of the P5 were separately briefed by the Foreign Secretary and that a very large number of other envoys were briefed. Mm -hmm. Diplomatic pressure will have to be mounted by many important countries on Pakistan because terrorism emanating from Pakistan has begun to hurt everybody. Okay. Uh, of course, I must mention to you that we have to take certain steps ourselves. Uh, there is a hue and cry about whether India should play cricket with Pakistan or not. Now, if a country is harming you so much, I think it's important to cut off relationships to the maximum extent possible. I have maintained that Pakistan has a very huge high commission set up here and that it is virtually a nest of spies. It is a, it's a den from where anti-India activities are carried out. The High Commission maintains very close links with Kashmiri separatists. It gives monetary assistance. Mm -hmm. I think this has been reported in the papers. So, I have maintained that this High Commission should be asked to pack up and the diplomats sent back home and we should recall our diplomats. Because we cannot have a normal relationship with a country which is hell-bent on hearing you, on, on hurting you. Mm -hmm. Of course, I know that such a decision is not likely to be taken, though I wish it would. We should at least insist on downscaling the Pakistan High Commission and Here downscaling our own High Commission there. Mm -hmm. Because the larger this apparatus is, the more likely it will hurt us. Okay. Moreover, only if we scale down our direct interaction with Pakistan can we tell other countries that they should also cut down their relationships. Now, as far as putting pressure on Pakistan is concerned, you have mentioned the FATF. Pakistan is already on the grey list. It has been put on the grey list because of intense Indian diplomatic pressure. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a meeting which is currently going on in Paris. There will be another meeting in May, followed by a third meeting in September. Pakistan has to show that it is complying with the requirements of the FATF. In all likelihood, it will not be able to okay. because there were eight organizations from Pakistan which were proscribed by the FATF, which were banned. And one of them is Jashi Muhammad, which has claimed responsibility for the Pulwama terror attack. So how can Pakistan say that it has complied with the requirements of the FATF when organizations which are banned by the FATF are claiming responsibility for terror attacks? So it will be difficult for Pakistan to respond as well. Dr. Cholia, uh, you know, in your uh, perspective, uh, the way uh, we have uh, upped the ante diplomatically against Pakistan and the kind of results it has delivered, uh, how do we go ahead and sustain those results uh, the way you know by ambassador dial is pointing out few more steps few more strong steps need to be taken as well yeah i think we shall uh, we have to also you know emphasize on the narrative that we are putting out you see um, to be able to uh, corner a country isolate or marginalize uh, it requires a kind of a very sustained uh, information campaign on a global scale you know, and uh, beyond uh, embassies and high commissions and uh, high authorities we need to invest a lot in you know, pushing out a message, showing uh, the true colors of this uh, rogue state. And I think that requires you know, a far bigger effort in terms of propaganda. See, what has happened is, you see, uh, if you look at many countries, they still look at what happened uh, in Pulwama and uh, other such incidents as part of some kind of a you know, dispute that these two countries have about Kashmir. Mm -hmm. That's, but we, have, we are now saying that it's gone far beyond that and what is uh, the real problem is a kind of a um, military machine that is using proxies as part of its, you know, uh, and uh, creating a kind of a environment that is inimical to human rights and to human dignity. And 
if we take that further, see the only successful case where a country was actually isolated through a global campaign was the apartheid regime in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that, it took 20 years finally for the pressure to yield results and finally for the regime to change there. So uh, we and apartheid, remember, was about uh, abusive minority that was in control of a state and where the majority black people were suppressed as second class citizens. So that had a certain appeal in the international community where people said, oh my God, here are like, you know, 10% of the society ruling over the remaining 90% uh, in a highly brutal and oppressive manner. Okay. So I think we have to also look at what Pakistan is doing internally to its own people, to its minorities and to the civilians in general. Because until we bring the narrative to that level, if we keep saying that it is a sponsor of terrorism in Iran, in Afghanistan, in India, people still see, okay, maybe they have some disputes. See, so we should not assume as Indians, as victims, we think that everybody understands. But everybody still doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. And everybody still frames this as some kind of a bilateral dispute that these countries have and this violence is happening as a result of it. So to change it to another track and for people to, you know, news media, for public opinion and of course government elites uh, around the world for invest around the world to believe that this is a completely different scenario where there we have a kind of a pariah regime that must be completely okay. distanced. We need to look at what they're doing in Balochistan, what they're doing in the Khyber to the Pashtuns. We need to be talking about, you know, the general suppression of the civilians under a military yoke. And we have to bring these things out because until people see this as a regime that is harming its own people, uh, as its own citizens, as in Pakistanis, as well as its neighbors, we need that comprehensive okay. messaging. Otherwise, so, it, I'm, I'm afraid that no matter how much we lobby or not, the old uh, mentality is to see that maybe these, like look at the UN so Secretary General. We'll have to General. change the narrative. That's, Vishal, that's Vishal, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres says, he has advised both India and Pakistan to exercise maximum restraint. This is the same old formula, right? Mm -hmm. Who should exercise restraint? We are the victims and they are telling us we should exercise restraint. So they are understanding it in a different uh, frame and mm -hmm. we have to change that frame and that is a challenge. Okay, Smita, uh, uh, responding to Dr. Chalia, change the frame, change the narrative, uh, bring those, you know, uh, internal uh, troubles which Pakistan has uh, in, in, in Balochistan, in Khyber Pakhtunwa, bring them to the table. Well, that's uh, something that you've tried doing. Remember the Prime Minister in his first uh, Independence Day speech uh, where he addressed the nation from the podiums, uh, from the ramparts of the Red Fort, uh, where the reference of Balochistan came up. But you'll have to think through it because there will be international ramifications when you start talking about Balochistan in the public domain. Are you prepared for it, especially at a time when India also makes public its interest in having a global aspiration of being a global player along with a seat on the, on the high on the table in the UNSC, Security yeah. Council? Mm -hmm. Having said that look there are of course efforts being made you have withdrawn that MFN status which you gave to Pakistan in 1996 uh, not sure how much of a direct impact it will really have because you hardly have business with Pakistan but symbolically it is important in addition to FATF you're also trying to put pressure on the European Commission to ensure that Pakistan is blacklisted but unless the countries that are involved you know if Pakistani prime ministers can continue to go to a China get a six billion dollar aid go to UAE get six billion dollar aid, uh, have the Saudi uh, Arab prince come in and offer them $20 billion of aid. Economically, how are you going to crush them and how are you going to economically affect the military that continues to call the shots when it comes to Pakistan's strategy and foreign policy? Mm -hmm. That's something India will have to continue. I, I agree with Dr. Chalia. You have to be realistic. You know, while there might be a lot of hyperbole about your success in terms of the global condemnations that pour in, you still have leaders like a Jeremy Corbyn in the United Kingdom who refer to this uh, terror attack as a an case of violence and ask India and Pakistan to talk about it. You are also in the middle of an American endgame in Afghanistan. That mm -hmm. changes the dynamics a lot. And that's uh, significant as well. It's significant. Barack Obama, remember in 2008, he upset a lot of people in the run-up to the elections when he continued to say that the road to peace in Kabul, K for Kabul, runs through Kashmir. Uh, in his administration, you saw Richard Holbrook being appointed as the special envoy to Afpak. India had to really lobby hard to ensure that India was not in the mandate for Holbrook. At a time when you the U.S., pull out from Afghanistan is imminent. Uh, the jihadi forces are, you know, propagating mm -hmm. the idea that, look, we taught the Soviets a lesson, the Americans are pulling back, so what is India going to be like? Mm -hmm. Pakistan can therefore try and continue to poke around and see how far is India willing to escalate and how long will the other countries involved in Afghanistan in the neighborhood be able to sit back. The other thing, while Ambassador Dayal, I know, is very experienced, he might say that uh, shutting down of missions, I'm not sure how it works 
works because we did see that happen in the wake of the parliament attacks that mm -hmm. was the last time in fact when the envoy had been recalled yeah. even in the wake of 26 11 we did not see the envoys being recalled from pakistan but in the wake of 26 11 strikes vishal we did see heads roll we did see resignations come in. I think at the end of the day, India also has to realize that if your army convoys, if your security personnel are getting hit, not just in wartime zones, but in peacetime stations, and not just through people who are infiltrating in, but through local recruits, if there is an intelligence lapse, will heads roll? Will somebody be held accountable to it? Because you have to make sure that your internal security mechanisms okay. are solid enough Every other country is going to play along only as far as their national interest allows them to play along. Okay, with. let's bring in Ambassador Dal. Ambassador Dal, two significant aspects here, uh, and you know, uh, events have also taken place uh, just around uh, that uh, dastardly attack, uh, terror attack in Pulwama. One, uh, the attack on uh, revolutionary guards uh, in Iran. The other, in Afghanistan, the, the way things keep on happening, and both countries, uh, at the same time, have accused Pakistan of perpetrating those uh, terror uh, attacks or supporting those terror elements. So should we go ahead and, you know, uh, also uh, bring uh, bring forth uh, their uh, aspect and also sort of, you know, strike uh, uh, some sort of arrangement with them and also, uh, you know, try and corner Pakistan regionally? Because as Smita was pointing out, in the region also, we will have to look what is happening in our backyard. Well, before I respond to your question, let me just mention to Smita that while I said I wish that we would shut mm -hmm, up the Pakistan mm -hmm. High Commission and bring back our diplomats, I also said I know it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But at least we should scale down the, pre the Pakistani sure. diplomatic presence. Because it is yeah, sheer mischief. Well, that's, that's for the government to go ahead and decide whether it is efficacious. I also want to mention that as I was waiting here in the anteroom, I was watching a television channel, there was a debate going on and there was a Pakistan retired uh, general or air marshal or whatever who was very often seen on our television channels he, and he was soundly and roundly abusing us. Why do we invite such people to appear on our television channels? If we want that we should not play cricket, why should we even have Pakistani generals appearing on our television channels mm -hmm. and roundly abusing us? Now, to come to your question, Iran and Afghanistan. Iran and Afghanistan. These two countries are suffering like we are from extremist Sunni Wahhabi Islam. Iran has, in a mirror image of the Pulwama attack, lost 27 of its revolutionary guards in a suicide bomb attack. And it has accused Pakistani citizens of involvement. Afghanistan has for a long time been undergoing attacks mm -hmm. from the Haqqani faction, mm -hmm. which is again very closely aligned with the ISI. Mm -hmm. So, really speaking, it's these three countries which must get their acts together, combine and put an end to the sort of terror which is emanating from Pakistan. The difficulty is that the US-Iranian relationship would be an impediment mm -hmm. because the United States would not want any sort of uh, military assistance to be pumped into Iran and Iran needs that because the Pakistani military machine is armed to the teeth and getting more so through China. Mm -hmm. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, things are in a better situation there because the Americans would be very happy as they pull out to pump in weaponry into the Afghan fighting machine so that it can take care of its security needs. Mm -hmm. We should do likewise. There are calls for Indian soldiers to be stationed in Afghanistan. I think boots on the ground is something that we should avoid. But we should give as much military assistance to Afghanistan as possible so that it can mount a lot of pressure on okay. Pakistan, on Pakistan's western border. Okay. Now, the, having said that, I must tell you that we have to have a strategy for the near term and we should have a strategy long for the term. long term. The near-term strategy is FATF, the UN Security Council resolution putting uh, Masood Azhar on the terror band list mm -hmm. and withdrawing MFN. The longer-term strategy is how to inflict more pain on Pakistan. Pakistan has designed its strategy through years of thinking and thinking through. Mm -hmm. We have never had a strategy to hurt Pakistan. We only react when something happens. 
I think we should put in place a strategy to inflict harm and pain on Pakistan in the long term. Okay. Now, let me submit. Mm -hmm. Withdrawing MFN is not going to have more than a symbolic effect. As Smita said, our trade is so small that how much will it do damage to Pakistan? Mm -hmm. it, it has mm -hmm. bigger trading relationships which will mm -hmm. help it out. But suppose we would think of certain other approaches. Like for instance, we put a ban on companies okay. which operate in Pakistan and say that if you are uh, trading in Pakistan, if you have set up offices there, you are not allowed to okay, do so that. Yeah. So, or uh, airlines which are, or touch Pakistan will not be allowed to touch. So basically, the, we are, how, how to for what extent it can work, I do not know. Okay. Ships which touch Pakistani ports should, will not be allowed to touch India. Okay. I do not know what can work. But we have but to think in the long run and of course, figure out See, what is possible, so what is not. Lo long term measures will have to be taken. Big time pain. You have to inflict big time pain on Pakistan. Dr. Chalia? Vishal, I think, see, we have to also study the Pakistani economy and its external benefactors more closely. So, of course, China and Saudi are the main, you know, the ones who have been bailing them out repeatedly and we've mentioned that. But you look at the trade profile of that country, you look at the tax base of that country, you look at the stock exchange of the country, which are the foreign capitals uh, with which they are connected. If you do a detailed you know, field study of uh, Pakistan's vulnerabilities in the economic sphere, you will find, for example, that you know, countries like Malaysia or Japan, Kuwait, UAE, these have also been you know, major trading partners. Mm -hmm. So we should be engaging with many of these on one-on-one -on -one basis and looking to see how we could potentially you know uh, coordinate to put a squeeze on the pakistani exports you know and frankly these are all bilateral uh, initiatives that we have to take up so i would suggest a kind of a field mapping of pakistan as a uh, as an as an entity and not just the geopolitical you know iran afghanistan obviously makes sense in geographical terms but think about it in terms of its survival as a state it is living hand to mouth existence repeatedly seeking bailouts seeking loans defer kicking the can down the road does not have a you know even a tax base to collect so how do we and then they have a lot of overseas you know funds where people people okay. are channeling like our hawala but they've got even worse things mm -hmm. so in dubai and elsewhere so we need to tap into those and look at how we could strangulate them through these processes so i think we have to really look at uh, you know it's like if you see the chanakya niti the one the my uh, you know uh, my neighbor's neighbor is my ally you know that kind of thing does happen and that does fit that model fits in this case with iran and afghanistan okay. but we have to go beyond it and we are in the era of the so-called you know uh, globalization or the end we are reaching a kind of a crisis in globalization but still pakistan is embedded in these global networks and we need to try and snap some of these and then you will see the results okay so basically what you're saying is that the diplomatic efforts need to complement uh, the other aspect as well and spe specifically in pakistan's case economic as well concluding comments from you smita on the, on the way forward and then the way it should be going well, of course, the diplomatic offensive has to be there and you have to wait it out patiently for results to come in. Because, as I said, for every country, its national priorities are going to take place. Uh, uh, I do remember distinctly that uh, when the ASEAN heads of states were invited as the Republic Day chief guests uh, for, uh, by India, the Indonesian president had gone to Pakistan first and was coming into India from there. There was a lot of furor. And I have it from diplomatic sources that a lot of pressure was mounted on Indonesia to make sure that while in Pakistan, there would be no mention of Kashmir in the statements and eventually Indonesia and Pakistan did not put forward a joint statement at all after that meeting. Mm -hmm. So these kind of offensives have to continue because uh, you know if you're not going to war how do you go through it by Georgia instead of war war. Having said that B I still think that you need to do your internal introspection if your forces like the CRPF are making demand of resources. Are you being able to provide them the same? Mm -hmm. Are you being able to sit down and actually introspect what went wrong? Where did your intelligence failures happen? Do you have a policy in place for a longer blueprint of how to deal with the situations? And finally, I think at the end of the day in Kashmir, there is a problem which you need to address. You have to move from conflict management to conflict resolution. So everything will have to go hand in hand. Ambassador Dal, final Smita, words. Just to remind you that the subject is global pressure on Pakistan. There is a lot, there is a separate discussion we can have 
on no, what we need to do internally. You can, uh, because but global pressure will not so yield your results. Everything will have to go hand in hand with each other. For this discussion, we have to reconfine to this. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we can go ahead and have you know keep on having discussions on all aspects of it. There are several aspects, but let's have final word from Dr. Cholia before we call it. Vishal, if we do more surgical strikes, covert operations, other actions, punitive measures. Most of the international community is going to be with us. We must take hope in that. So while they may not, they, we may not be ready for comprehensive isolation of Pakistan right now, the fact is when we take retaliatory measures, it is fully justified. No state objected when we do, did this in 2016 also. Remember that. So the diplomatic ground for at least limited measures that will at least raise the cost of terrorism to Pakistan are already you know, justified fully by the international community. Nobody, not even China, said a word when we did surgical strikes okay. or, uh, you know, express any objections. So in that sense, we already have ground for limited action. But of course, that is not the solution. This has to be sustained, as our colleagues are saying. This has to be a long struggle to try and, uh, you know, corner this uh, rogue regime. They've all okay. agreed uh, to India's right to self-defense. Even the Russians and the Americans. So that we now. have. So at least strategically, we can take heart from that. You need to well, yes, definitely. It. And uh, clearly, as our panelists are pointing out, uh, and the way it has come out clearly is that uh, India's diplomatic efforts are bearing positive results, but we will have to be patient and keep on making those sustained efforts uh, to put pressure on Pakistan as well as take punitive measures to try and corner Pakistan on the issue of terror. We'll come back again tomorrow with a different topic and different set of guests. Till then, keep watching Rajasabha Television.